game, the game of the medicine right now is to find way to make yourself a low, low cost, high quality physician. So compared to a high cost and low quality person. Now, how do you do that? They don't teach you that in medical school. So you've been out of practice for 20, 30, 40 years. So you have to learn this yourself. So first thing you got to find out is how the pair know that you are a high quality, low cost physician. So they find out through their billing data. So whatever you bill, what diagnosis you bill is, is goes into the computer and the Medicare computer they tell you this Dr. Agarwal, he spent too much money and his quality data, like how often he does this, this, this is doesn't sound right. So he's a expensive physician, provide low quality work. So we're gonna cut his reimbursement. So if you're an independent physician, your reimbursement can cut down to by minus 9% of your Medicare. So, so this is the story of how to learn to become very effective, low cost and high quality physician in your pair eye as well as physician, uh, your patient's eye. You may be a high quality, low cost physician in your patient's eye, which is most of common happen. But now it is very important that the pair feel same way about you. So this series, we are gonna start this and try to learn, not only learn, practice this in, your, in our practice. So I would invite Dr. Bussell to tell us about his journey, about learning how to become a high quality, low cost physician doing the right thing. Dr. Bunsel. Uh, thank you, Subodh. Um, welcome everyone to the seminar about MRA. I'm in South Florida. As you know, South Florida had a, human, a HMO invasion long time back uh, before it affected other states. I remember I came in practice here in 1987. In Palm Beach County, it was a taboo to be associated with an HMO. But I saw changes within the three years of me arriving here. As HMOs spread, uh, quality also started to improve. Initially, we used to think it's the worst quality, but gradually we realized that CMS mandates HMOs to maintain their quality, and that's how they control it. So think about it. Before the ACOs came, Medicare fee-for-service was free for all. There was no quality measures at all. If you gave a pneumovac, uh, you gave it. If didn't, didn't matter. You gave a flu shot, fine. If you didn't give it, didn't matter. It didn't matter to a patient. But as far as CMS was concerned, uh, there was no penalty and there was no reward. If you had no colonoscopy done on your patient, as was indicated, there was no uh, no problem. But gradually, with the advent of ACOs, that has been changing more. So I have been in this primary care field, I'm a PCP, and gradually through the uh, all the HMOs or Advantage plans, gradually we learn that we have to perform, we have to do certain things uh, for these Advantage plans to stay on the good side of CMS. You know, they were punished if those were not done. Now, close to 10, 11 years back, it became much more uh, prominent. Most of the Advantage plans, they were started to be graded by star system, one to five. Now, there is hardly any uh, uh, Advantage plan which is star five, which is there. Big Advantage with the star five is that they're allowed to recruit patients throughout the year as compared to others. Plus, they get rewarded more money for the same patient with the same MRA if their HED score is five star. And same thing is going in our ACO, as you know. In the ACO, like in doctor's ACO and other ACOs, which are enhanced ACOs, you all get 5% uh, increased payment on your Part B expenses separately. But we are supposed to get 75% of the shared savings 
from Medicare, but we don't get 75% if we don't have a quality score of 100%. So if our quality score is 90%, then we get 90% of the 75%. So what Subodh was talking about was that it's not just enough to be a physician and practice the way we want. It is very important that we satisfy CMS regulations, uh, which are good regulations if they want to improve quality that's a good thing so two three things that we learned today we are not going to touch hedis measures maybe uh, we will touch those at a later date um, about the quality in our acos and even in advantage plan but today is a very important talking uh, we'll talk about medical risk adjustment it's also called RAF score which is risk adjustment factor it's the same thing um, so, Subodh, I'll hand it over to you if you want to talk a little bit more about MRA and its role, and then we'll move on. So, I, I want to introduce uh, David Karnavas. He's, uh, he's a really a great guy to teach us about, you know, a physician need to learn from smart people. And he's going to tell us why doctors in your physician need to learn about MRA, how it's going to affect their saving how they is going to affect their their score quality score and how they're going to um grow with the learning the right thing so think they didn't teach us in high school or in our medical school it's time to learn so they would tell us why a doctor's seo physician and their practice should and must learn mra the icd-10 codes that you submit on your bills is what Medicare uses to understand how sick your patients are. And then they use that as part of the benchmark calculations uh, for the ACO. So if your ICD-10 codes are less than the previous year, um, Medicare can reduce your shared savings unlimitedly so they can reduce your shared savings by 10 percent if your codes go down so it's extremely important extremely important especially during this emergency that you maintain the same icd-10 codes that you submitted the previous year furthermore if you can learn from experts like dr raj bansal and from carrie we're very lucky to have her and you're able to submit a few more ICD-10 codes to Medicare, which will show that your patients are, are maybe declining a little bit or having more advanced chronic illness, um, Medicare will allow your benchmark to increase by up to 3% in the following year. So there's definitely financial incentive through the ACO to increase it, and then absolutely please please do not let your mra score decrease um particularly on these telehealth visits because it can completely erase your shared savings one quick note i understand that dr acl uh, you're scheduled to have your best year ever so congratulations and please keep up those codes so if you increase the mra by 10 percent, how is going to affect the benchmark so if you increase your benchmark in 2020 by 10%, Medicare only permits the benchmark to go up by 3%, and then they're going to up your benchmark the following year. So your benchmark will increase next year, Dr. Agrawal, in 2021. It's still very important. It's just it happens next year. So 3% it means what for Dr. Cecil for benchmark in, in millions? So if the benchmark goes up by 3%, the payment to the ACO would be $3 million a year extra. Fantastic. So that what I want to say is worth really worth listening to Kerry. Kerry, Kerry could you come us and tell us about it? Tell, first, you tell us about you, how you learn about this, and then um, tell us uh, how we can learn from Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Um, well, as you know, my name is Carrie Shashak. I am a certified coder 
Um, I've been in the healthcare reimbursement uh, arena for probably about 28 years with 25 of them doing chart audits and chart reviews. Um, my main focus obviously is Medicare risk adjustment. Um, and I try to work with the doctors and make sure that they're aware of what these conditions are, um, how important it is to document them and document them clearly and accurately so that you get uh, excuse me, credit for the scores. Because you don't ever want to document conditions and then have them be eliminated because of documentation um, lacking support. So, so we're going to go through um, a little bit about risk adjustment. We're going to talk about some of the um, chronic conditions, some of the, um, okay. So the goal is we're going to talk about some of the Medicare risk adjustment common conditions. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about proper documentation and supporting evidence for your chronic conditions selecting the appropriate and correct code, which is also vital. Um, and then we're gonna go through a sample chart review. Um, so here you can see some of the chronic and most common conditions, diabetes, pulmonary, heart failures, dependencies and depressions. Um, I'm just gonna go through each of them very quickly. Uh, you can all read these slides at a later time. Um, so obviously you have diabetes um, with chronic kidney disease. The main thing that you need to know is that when you have a diabetic that also has chronic kidney disease, it requires that you document two codes. One code that says the patient is diabetes with CKD, but then you also must code the stage of the CKD because once it's at stage three, you get an additional score. Um, for the diabetes with the ophthalmic complications, the thing here is that you really need to be very specific in your documentation, whether you're documenting background retinopathy or proliferative retinopathy. Um, background will only get you one score, but if it's proliferative retinopathy, you'll get an additional score. So it's very important that your documentation is, is as robust as possible because if you're not being specific, they're gonna reduce you to the lesser of the scores. Um, here are some of your codes for your diabetes with neuropathy, um, just based on the type that you have, nothing new there. Um, diabetes with your PVD, again, is a category that will get you two scores but you need to code it correctly. Um, your diabetes with your skin conditions, those are your diabetics with your, with your chronic ulcers. You need to make sure that you are documenting chronic ulcers and you're documenting the stage of them. Um, and then you, you know, um, make sure that you document them and you code them appropriately. Um, unspecified and stages one or two don't qualify. So if you're not staging appropriately, you can lose your scores. Um, here's some of the other diabetic, uh, other specified complications. We see a lot of these, my, my tip for everybody here is that if you are using the code E1169 and you're documenting uh, where it says diabetes type two with other specified complications, if you do not document exactly what the complication is, you're gonna lose the score. You have to, when you use these other specified or in diseases classified elsewhere, you must exactly point to what that other disease is. Otherwise you have not fulfilled the evidence to use that code. Um, some of the uh, pulmonology categories, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, you have granuloma, COPD, uh, my, my, uh, oops, sorry. My comments there are when you're coding for COPD, uh, emphysema, make sure that you have some type of diagnostic test on file and that you note it in your progress notes just to support the conditions. My other tip here is if you have severe end stage COPD and you have a patient that is oxygen dependent, consider using chronic respiratory failure. Um, it comes with an additional score. Heart failures. 
So you have a couple different types of heart failure. Um, again, it all depends on how specific you document your, your notes. If you're just putting cardiomyopathy, you're going to get a score. But if it's due to um, alcoholism, you actually are going to code for the alcoholism and you're going to get two scores. Pulmonary hypertension, we look at the echoes. And once we see that the pressure is 35 or greater, that is our benchmark to recommend that the doctors consider pulmonary hypertension. Um, those are some of the things we look for. You can see the codes for CHF. Um, the one thing here that I just want to make sure that everybody is aware, we see a lot when you're coding acute on chronic, that is only to be used when it is actually an acute um, stage of the CHF. Once the acute is resolved, you have to revert back to chronic only. Anginas. We do see a lot of the anginas. Um, please just make sure you're specifying the type of angina, um, whether it's stable, unstable, um, whether it's, you know, uh, with spasm. The one thing that I will tell you here um, that is, is coming a big issue is when you're documenting um, CAD without angina, and then in your next entry, you're documenting angina, you're contradicting yourself, and you'll lose the score for the angina. Please make sure that you're using the most specific code and that your, your coding is accurate and you're not contradicting yourself. Um, your dependencies and addictions. Uh, the key thing here is you need to specify that it's a dependency or if it's a dependency in remission. When you document dependency, there, there is very clear um, language that, that uh, the auditors look for to support dependency. Um, but, you know, they're, they're looking for, you know, um, patients that are using amounts in excess of prescribed, um, they're looking to see if the patient has a tolerance and they've changed medications. Uh, you need to really clearly state uh, that it, it is a dependency versus just a long-term use. Um, and that all must be stated in your notes every time you document it. Major depression, same thing. Here's some of the qualifiers. You need to hit five or more in order to document major depression. Usually, typically, that's done with the PHQ-9. Once um, the patient is, is diagnosed with depression, and as you go along and you monitor them, if you're not documenting acute symptoms, you must document that the major depression is in partial remission due to the treatment plan. The only time you document severity is when you're documenting the acute um, categories, qualifiers. Um, Here's some of the codes that you use for the depression. I would steer everybody away from using single depression um, because if you don't document the severity, that is no longer an MRA condition. So for all of our physicians, we tell everybody to document major depression reoccurring. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the documentation. Um, it's um, you really need to make sure that you, for every condition that you are assessing and putting in your assessment area of your of your note, that your documentation is clear. You need to document the current status of the condition. You need to document your treatment plan, and of course, if you have any additional supporting evidence. Um, you should document that as well. If you are not documenting current status and treatment plan, then you have not assessed that condition that day and your MRA condition will be disqualified. Um, we do um, code selection based on your written progress note. Okay, so if you are simply stating depression, well, that's going to give you a code of Major depression, single, unspecified. That is not an MRA code. But if you document depression, major depression, single episode mild, 
then you're gonna get an MRI score. The key here is your documentation. Your documentation drives all of your coding. So if your documentation is weak or lacking, so is your MRA score gonna be reflective of that. Um, a couple of things that we see, that I see in the notes as an auditor um, that are contradicting is if you have, once you have a diabetic patient with a complication, you should never use diabetes unspecified, the E11.9, um, because they are no longer uncomplicated. Once they have a complication, with the exception of maybe a skin ulcer, they always have that complication. Um, you should also never unbundle your codes, such as diabetes uncomplicated, and then document PVD. The correct way to do it would be to use the combo code diabetes with the PVD. Uh, same thing down here, um, you know, do not code CAD without angina for the I25.10 and then code angina. Um, the correct way would be to use the combination code which states CAD with angina. Um, Again, some just some tips, you know, always make sure um, that what you're assessing uh, is supported in your note. Uh, you know, if you're assessing PVD, if you don't have a diagnostic study to support it, we're going to look to your clinical exam. Um, and I would venture to see something there in the negative. If everything is normal and you have no supporting documentation, it's, it's hard to validate that condition. Um, there are some other conditions, what we call incidental findings, calcified granulomas, atherosclerosis of the aorta. They're kind of um, conditions that really don't require treatment, but believe it or not, they are MRA conditions. Um, for things, those types of conditions, you just need to document the diagnostic test that confirmed the disease, and typically most providers just just listed as uh, stable monitoring, um, something of that nature, um, but just support it with your diagnostic test. So, having said all of that, I so we Carrie, wanted to let, take. Can, can can we take a break here and then let people ask some questions? Uh, is that okay, okay with? Sure. So let me ask you a few questions now. You know, most of our physicians in Georgia, you know, they see about 20, 30 patients. Where they have mm -hmm. MA, they have set up on their own setup. That's the way they do it. They've been doing that for 10 years. Now we try to tell them, okay, now you have to do this MRA diabetic, you need to look for this. If you are COPD, look for this. And basically, they've been treating those patients, but they're not documenting or they're not doing the right diagnosis. The question is how to change culture in the in the practice do we have any tools or something like that 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 in a patient there is a question mark there's a patient depression there's a question mark patient diabetes there's a sheet there so the ma can help the physician to document properly and co code it properly yeah there are some tips a lot of the emr systems out there allow you to do what we code hard code some information um, such as in your problem list. I know in ECW, which is a very popular system, in the problem list, when you add a condition, there's a note field. So, for example, if you had atherosclerosis of the aorta um, and it was confirmed by a, ch a simple chest x ray, in the note field, you just put confirmed by chest x ray and the date. And then every time the doctor selects that code in his note, it brings in the notes and that information is hard coded. They don't have to write it each time that they diagnose it. So there are certain ways that you can, you can hard code some of this evidence. Um, you know, a lot of times you could just say, refer to PHQ-9 dated a certain date, um, but really a lot of it is, is the doctors need to, to really be aware of the chronic conditions and some of the supporting evidence. Um, that they need to just state in their note. But I do encourage everybody that for, for as much as the hard-coded information that they can that they can put into their EMR system, the better off they are and the, the 
you know, it reduces their documentation requirements. Question is, if you people have psychiatrists or consultant, and mm -hmm. so they now we have a diagnosis uh, from consultant. Can you put that note in the chart that patient had major depression per psychiatrist note, something like that, rather than documenting separately? Yeah, you certainly can. You what you would do is just um, you know, in your assessment, diagnose, you know, you can put down, you know, major depression, you know, uh reoccurring part remission, patient being filed followed by psychiatrists continue with their treatment. That's a, that and that that is enough support. That that is the current status and the treatment plan. You are following following or monitoring that condition on behalf of your patient. So that's fine. So if the, bo the bottom line is, is that you just need to document the current status of the condition in the treatment plan, whether you're treating it, you're monitoring it, you're um, just overseeing, being the oversight provider, you still need to document the conditions and just state that. So anybody has any question, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask for it. Hey, this is David. Quick question is: a note from a I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's so much feedback. I can't hear you. I can't even type. This thing not working. I can't unmute. Rochelle, can okay. you mute everybody, please? There's a few few people not on mute. Okay, so um, Carrie, if the PCP receives a specialist note and maybe it has PBD or CKD, um, yes. can they take those ICD-10 codes and use the specialist note as justification or do they additionally need the tests that substantiated those codes? Uh, no, I mean, if they're being followed by a specialist, what I tell the providers is, is when you pull that CKD stage three into your note, just say, um, I would always suggest that you have the report on file and that in your assessment, you just say, um, currently under the care of nephrologist, see report and, and put the date of the most recent report. And that's enough support. You, you just have to validate that you know you, that you're at least monitoring, evaluating, assessing, or treating the condition. That is what your note has to convey. So in this condition, in this case, you're really just monitoring um, the care of, from the nephrologist. So you just need to acknowledge that you're monitoring it and then just point to the most recent report. So it's so important to have those specialist notes on file. Hey, uh, this is Dr. Bashir, nephrologist. I got a question. Um, if I am treating a patient with stage four chronic kidney disease and hypertension, and patient also have congestive heart failure, I understand there is a code available for CKD for secondary to hypertension, and there is also code available CKD for with hypertension and congestive heart failure. Is the adding that congestive heart failure will give a more M MRC score? And then you yes, have to say systolic and diastolic. Yes, I, you, that's a great question. There is a code, it's I13.0, which is hypertensive heart disease with kidney, uh, chronic kidney failure stage one through four. Um, so in order to qualify for that code, obviously you have to have the CKD stage one through four. You must also document that that patient has um, congestive heart failure. If you go to the coding guidelines in your book, while you're entitled to use that code I13.0, the directions also say you must also document and code your CHF separately. So, but then you will get um, the multiple scores because you'll get the score for the CHF and you'll get the score for the CKD4. Coming up, see, one check come from Dr. Vinod Sachetti from New Jersey. 
He said, does it require outpatient coding to be more legit and appropriate or inpatient hospital coding also? Every day, hospital clinical documentation, especially bother doctors to upcode, even if the doctor is not there. This is his comment. Dr. Sajeti from, from New Jersey. What are you saying? Whatever coded in the hospital, can you use that code in outpatient setting or vice versa or, or do your own personal coding? That's a his question. Yeah, the outpatient um, documentation requires are a lot stricter than the hospital. Um, but you certainly, we do pull as, as coders and auditors, we do look at all those records and we do say to the providers, you know, look to these hospital records, here's some conditions here you need to evaluate and start pulling into your notes. So um, in that perspective, we do use some hospital records, but your outpatient and your office um, documentation requirements are much more strict than your hospital documentation. And don't forget, hospitals are also allowed to, to document and submit rule out conditions where in the office setting you are not. So the, the question comes from Sopti. Say, is the hard code added, will that come up every time we add the diagnosis for each patient or will only be documented to the patient who charged the hard code was added? I don't understand the question, but do you understand? I do. I do. <laughs> Yes, if you hard code something into the problem list, it will only appear for that patient, but it will appear every time you use the code for that patient. So in other words, you have you would have to hard code the evidence for each patient. So this is a, a chat from Roberta Hunter. She said, when I yeah. try and bundle diabetes with another condition, so many codes come up, I don't have time to find out what. So what's the easy answer to that when you have diabetes with other complications? So my suggestion there is if you if you're using if you're trying to use the diabetes with that other specified condition, which is the E11.69, you're gonna have to free text what that what that is. Or um, sometimes in, in some of the EMR systems, when you add that code E1169 into your problem list hard coded in your notes field that just says um, diabetic hyperlipidemia or um, uh, CAD impacting diabetes. Whatever that other condition is, you could hard code it into your note field. Great, if there are no question, now the exciting part starts. Um, go ahead, Carrie, uh, show us how you look at the chart. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to take a look at, at, at a couple of, well, I took a look at a couple of charts today. Um, I, I've, I've gathered a couple of blinded um, records just to kind of show everybody um, the role of the coder and, and what we look for and how we validate some of the, um, the actual codes uh, and the documentation. Let me just one second here. Let me see if I can pull it up. Can everybody see that screen? Okay, so here is an example of a blinded note. As you can see, it's pretty typical note, reason for the appointment, history of present illness, then you have your vitals. So the first thing that I noticed here, there's no BMI recorded and there's no height. So if this member, based on the fact that it's 193 pounds, could potentially be a candidate for morbid obesity, but I wouldn't know that because the documentation is not there. Uh, another thing that I start to notice is some of the medications that the members are on. And you can see they're on quite a few, uh, quite a few sedatives. Um, we've got some lithium going on there. So we continue on, we go through here, we see our physical exam, there's nothing popping out here. So now all of a sudden we have in your assessment area, we have shortness of breath, okay? But in my exam for the lungs, no evidence of discomfort, nothing abnormal. I have obstructed sleep apnea. I, again, I don't, I don't find any evidence to support that condition based on the clinical exam. 
Um, and then I have, which is very interesting, is obesity due to excess calories without serious comorbidities. However, I would consider obstructive sleep apnea a, a serious co uh, comorbidity. So let me just scroll on. We also come to a statement in the note that says echo shows only mild hyper hypertensive heart disease, which would be coded I-11.9, yet that did not appear at all in the assessment, um, even though that is supporting evidence right there that tells me that the echo on file, that was the result of the echo. You can also see that the only treatment plan was for the shortness of breath. So in this case, the only condition that is supported in this note is shortness of breath. If obstructive sleep apnea were an MRI condition, it would be disqualified because there's no supporting documentation that this member has obstructive sleep apnea. It was not assessed that day. There is no current status. There is no treatment plan. So, okay. Can I say something? Yeah. Defending the person, the physician. Yeah. All this diagnosis came from the previous chart. So while you're coding auditing chart, you just see one day or you see a serial chart like a day before, a month before, a year before, and, and well, this depression or this thing was not mentioned, should have mentioned somewhere, but this time the doctor got very busy and just forgot to put all those things yeah. together. Um, as a coder and an auditor, yes, I go through the entire history of the chart, and, and I can certainly tell you that these are valid conditions. However, CMS has a requirement that every progress note is a standalone document. So when they look at this document, if only one of those conditions were truly assessed by means of current status and treatment plan, all other conditions would be disqualified for that note for that day because they were not assessed properly in that progress note. See here, I'm trying to defend. I, I try to be my doc, I'm defending this physician. Sure. The past medical history, you know, I'm telling you all this thing. We have depression, we have chronic back pain, we have asthma, anxiety, allergy, and uh, hyperlipidemia, insomnia, migraine, obstructive sleep apnea and sinusitis is recurrent. So this documentation does not justify putting obstructive sleep apnea here? No, it does not because the category very clearly states past medical history. And when you document history in the eyes of the coding world and CMS, it means those conditions have been resolved. Um, let me just go. Let me just go further, um, and let me just also note that. Um, so here's here's some of the things that that we would come up with, and just based on this simple note, I would say to the provider, okay, based on your best medical history, I, I do see that there's depression there. You know, that is an MRI code. Is is that something that's resolved? Um, or is that something that's ongoing? Is it is it currently being treated? Um, so I would look that I, I believe that there would be a potential for depression if it was correctly assessed and documented, which is an MRI condition. I also would, would pull a provider and say, you know, based on the medication list and based on the fact that I've now gone through the entire chart and I can, I can support a pattern of multiple sedative dependence, anxiety meds, um, I would, I would bring to your attention um, the fact that maybe you would need to consider um, sedative dependence. Um, I also would say to the provider, exactly what condition are you treating with the lithium? Because typically that's a bipolar and that again would be another MRI condition. So, so obviously there's a lot of other conditions that can be extracted from this chart that are never being assessed. Um, so that was just this one. I did, did you see how they ordered the PVT um, um, that day, which was good. Here's the same patient. Here's another note. Um, and like 
if you notice the dates, this is two months later. It says follow up on COPD. Okay, so you do see that the they're looking to refill the medication for the COPD, which is great. Um, we do have a BMI here, which is great. We also see that they're still taking the lithium. You go further down, the assessment seems very good. Their lungs expands normal, no evidence of discomfort. So now we have an assessment of GERD. We have eczema of the face, which is interesting because when you go to the skin, no suspicious lesions, nothing. Then we have chronic bronchitis unspecified. Okay, so that could technically be a form of the COPD. And then we have the hyperlipidemia. But as you can see, the only things that were truly assessed that day were the GERD and the eczema. So those truly are only the, the only valid conditions that could really be reported that day. And I would question the fact of the conflicting information on the exam of the skin and the need to document eczema and um, prescribe a medication when your exam said that the skin was clear. Oh, so then oh. you, you really need to start paying a little bit more attention. Um, you know, if you don't have supporting evidence, you know, you really need to document, um, you know, current status of treatment plan. You know, we, we're looking for something in the note that would support it because if there's nothing in the note, you're going to lose that MRI score. So, Karen, let me ask you. So now you audit this chart and yeah. how, how, what are you going to do to change the behavior of the physician or their practice or their MA? So, would you sit so down what, and write a note or, or sit down with them or write a note? or see if they see the way you seeing things yeah so so what we do as as part of an um our review and our audit we we collect all the data on an excel spreadsheet and and then we um communicate that information to a provider now what i will tell you about this patient here um if you went through the chart they've now been di diagnosed with asthma um they've you they've used chronic bronchitis once or twice, they've used COPD once, um, but actually what was in the chart was a spirometry on file from the prior year that showed a severe obstruction. So they probably, the pulmonologist calls it asthma, but they, you, you are qualified at that point to code it as chronic obstructive asthma, which is an MRI condition and simple asthma is not. And you're qualified to do that because you have that PFT on file that supports the obstruction. And that would be a case where I would put chronic obstructive asthma in your problem list and I would hard code the PFT on file and the date of the file, or the date of the report. So all that feedback is given by virtue of reports that we extract when we do these chart reviews. Um, I can show you and then you know, a lot of times um, where they're lacking support or their physicians are using codes that are inappropriate. Um, I'll kind of give you a, a sample look at what some of these, um, well, particularly my reviews would look like. They're very colorful, but if you get a chart review result from me and there's a lot of color on it, the color means that there was an error. So for example, you see this patient here, they have diabetes with hyperlipidemia, that was fine. I record when they document it. They're using this provider is documenting other specified PVD, um, which because the fact that this patient is a diabetic is an incorrect code selection. They should only be using E1151. So that condition goes on my discontinued use. So my instruction to the doctor is to remove that from the problem list and discontinue the use because it's incorrect code. Um, here you can see diabetes with other circulatory complications. Um, here, you know, this is questionable. Um, there was, a, there was a, a diagnostic study on file for the carotid artery. Um, 
that showed that um, the study was abnormal, but it was less than 50% obstructed. But in the doctor's pro in the doctor's note, he wrote that the carotid ultrasound was within normal limits. So once he wrote within normal limits, he can't use that code. So he imported the incorrect evidence. So we provide, after we do our chart reviews or I do my chart reviews, I provide all this evidence to the providers. I work with the MAs um, you know, and their administrative staff. Typically the provider will review some of this, they'll agree or disagree. And then based on the provider feedback, we then work on their problem lists. And we make their problem list as robust as possible we hard code as much as the evidence as possible. Um, some EMR systems, we can actually flag that it is an MRA condition, which will alert the providers um, that they need to document it. Um, you know, but those are the types of things that the coders would do to help assist the providers um, to lessen their burden. Um, you know, we'll, we'll give them feedback for if there's a more specific code to use. Uh, but whatever the case may be, whatever my feedback is, um, I'll put it in my comments uh, section. And then typically we give them a report that kind of looks like this. And we're going to ask them if these are the conditions that you're documenting, but you do not have enough support. And I'll suggest the type of support that you need. And then we would give them some communication that says you're also using these conditions and you absolutely should not be using them. And I would recommend removing them from your problem list. So those are the kind of feedback and information that we provide to the providers um, based on our chart review results. Um, but again, these, co these codes are all driven by the doctor's written documentation and the lack thereof. So, so they, it's, they, the it's so important. Had, the Kelly physician had to act on your recommendation on the next office visit or they can make the changes uh, before a patient comes in? Yeah, it, you know, it, there's, um, that's a little gray area. Every health plan um, has their, their typical benchmark of, of the allotted time that they allow you to do an addendum. The, the hard fast rule from CMS is within a reasonable time frame, but they've not defined it further. Um, a lot of the big players out there will say, um, they would not allow an addendum beyond 30 days. Um, so, so what we tell the providers is, is it's at their discretion. If they feel comfortable enough to update and do an addendum, uh, amend their, their progress note, um, you know, go ahead and do that. If not, then we suggest that you reschedule the patient and bring them back in so that you can assess the condition. Okay, you send the office note to CMS or you send the billing to the CMS? No. No, no, no. Um, I don't send anything. I'm just the coder and auditor. I'm just but, trying to. Uh, the prop, no, the, the progress notes do not go. What happens is, is you submit your encounters to the health plan and or CMS directly. Um, and I'm sure everybody is aware that, that we're in a, a percentage process now where your MRI scores are taken percentage from the RAPS file and a percentage from the encounter encounter data that the provider is submitting. Come 2022, your MRI scores are going to be solely based on your encounter submission. So what's so going to happen is Kelly, you're going to you, submit your Kelly, you mean yeah. encounter submit mean the billing, billing data. Yes, what the billing. Okay. Yes, the billing. So okay. when you submit your billing with all these codes, you know, it goes through the system, it calculates your score. But then as those periodic reviews come around and they do a random pull and they say, okay, for patient X, here's your diagnosis that you submitted and built your score. Give me one note for each one of those conditions that supports that condition within that time period. So you, you, have, you have to produce a note. And if your note does not support that condition, CMS will remove the score. And it's it's on a post audit review, so so you you may get the funds up front, but you'll lose them on the back end. Should that record be pulled for an audit and there's no support, because in CMS's eyes, remember I said every progress note is a standalone document. So let me tell you, we have 87 people 
Uh, and now we have 83 people. Now we have 10 minutes to go. So I'm gonna, everybody get unmuted and then go ahead and ask question. And Gary, you did a great job reviewing this uh, patient, one alone. And he really taught me a lot of things. So please ask, you can, you can uh, do the chat on the chat and write your questions. And, or you can go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask questions. Ten Gary, minutes. I have a question. Sure. Okay. This, is, this is Dr. Saini from New Jersey. Sure. So you are saying every node is supposed to be a standalone node. Some of the patients are very complicated. They have 15, 20 diagnoses. I yeah. cannot 20 diagnoses in one note. I cannot be sitting with the patient for two hours. No, and, and, and nobody, nobody is expecting that all of those conditions be assessed in one um, office visit setting. Um, the requirement is, is that you, sub, you submit your chronic conditions at, at least once a year. We say twice a year, but the CMS requirement is actually once a year. So if you document, say, your first 10 chronics, um, you know, in the visit today, and then you document, you know, in the follow-up visit that happens, you know, two months from now or a month from now or a two-week follow-up, then you assess some of the others, that's fine as well. You just have to make sure that you, you document and assess each chronic condition at least once during the course of the year. So we... In our MSO, we tell our providers twice a year because it's a timing issue. If you document it in the beginning of January in 2019 and you don't document it again until December of 2020, you've actually lost some funding. So we tell everybody twice a year. So a corollary question, and this will be my last question. So I'll sure. give us a chance to ask questions. So. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, it went blank for a while. Yeah. So, so, so tell me, this is a challenge. This is something that we doctors have to fix. Yes. Some, same patient, multiple problems. But these patients don't want to come back. And, and we do, I do, I do assess only two or three conditions because that's okay. all that we have, even if we spend 20, 30 minutes with a patient because these patients are very complicated. So when we bring them back sooner, the patients don't want to come in. And if, we, if they, they come back in a longer time frame, then we don't have time to assess everything else. How do so, we how do we deal with let's, this? Let me pick that up, uh, uh, Manish. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Van. So, so Manish, this is what I used to do. When you are on advantage plans, it's very important. So suppose there are 20 conditions listed, of which I would say there are not more than 10, which are MRA conditions. True. So what I used to do on that patient, one time when you are addressing the note, you address somebody has depression, that uh, talk to the patient, depression, it's controlled, he doesn't feel more depressed, but con con wants to continue with the medication. Same, CHF, patient does not have increased shortness of breath, is uh, basically controlled on Lasix, whatever he's on, uh, or ACE inhibitor. So I would have each condition addressed in the note and you can always copy it and bring it back <clears throat> in the note uh, again, instead of writing everything again. But what happens is <clears throat> that way you are addressing it. The second thing is all these patients, if they have 10 conditions, they should be seeing you every two or three months, not every six months anyway. I agree, right. So, so then it works out. So we are lucky that we need to increase our MRA in the ACO only by say 5% because we get 3% increase, which is very little. But advantage plans are paid, every penny comes through your risk score. Every, every penny, every condition counts. So it becomes very important to document very thoroughly. And that's why these plans pay you much more than Medicare fee for service to take care of that uh, on time. Um, so when the patient comes, as long as you address it, at least every six months, all the conditions, you will be okay with that. And it's doable. In fact, Dr. Henson will talk at the end something more about the advantage class. Right. So, so Thank you. Invite Dr. Roy Dania. He has a question. 
goes yes, high. Thank you. So, you know, this is a, such a complicated issue, so I don't even know if I have a proper question, but be as it may. Uh, like Raj said, you know, we, this HMO and, and, and MA plans, you know, they, for 15 years back, they started coaching us on MRA. It was extremely important that our MRA scoring was done correctly. So it became second nature. And uh, the problem happens when, I think if it's a single doctor practice, whatever he does for himself goes to him. So the doc, the single practice doctors do generally a good job. The problem happens when you add a physician or another physician or, 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 or make it a group practice. So one thing we found very useful was to have a cheat sheet, which I don't think you mentioned. Uh, perhaps it's not such a good idea anymore. The other thing is, when do you, at what level of numbers of physicians do you recommend using a coder? We had a coder in our practice because we were seven caregivers. Uh, and are a lot of doctors using code coders to help them audit and suggest what needs to be done? Yes. I, I There are providers out there that are doing hiring coders. Um, and, you know, based on the the volume of the practice, the amount of, of risk patients they have, um, you know, that all comes into play. There are a lot of things um, that we do um, for our providers to um, help them along with their MRA. One thing that, that we I've done in the past is, is um, as the coder, I would write what we call the one perfect note. And I would actually write the assessment and the treatment plan and have it ready prior to that patient's visit so that it's in the physician's hands. Um, and then he has exactly the cheat sheet for every condition with the supporting evidence and the last treatment plan on file. And the physician has the option of updating the treatment plan. But at least from a coder's perspective, the conditions are there, the evidence, the support is there. And all the physician has to do is update it as needed and pull it into his progress note. So those are some things we can do. We also do for some providers that we have remote access to, we do a process called pre-screening pre where we'll go in um, to their scheduler that day. We'll identify all their risk adjustment patients and we will actually push all of the confirmed MRA conditions into the assessment area to alert the provider that those are the conditions that need to be assessed that day. Um, you know, we also help the, the offices hard code a lot of this information um, so that they, they do pass the audits and nothing is questioned. So, so there are a lot of different things that you can do to track it and help the providers and, and lessen that burden. Um, but there is, I mean, make no mistake about it, there, there is administrative work too any type of advantage no. plan. I, I hear complaints all the time. So I do believe that, you know, barring a single doctor who's not very busy, anything beyond that, I, I think doctors need help and some kind of an audit on a regular basis to do this correctly because there are so many aspects to it and so many moving parts. So yeah. perhaps you should send me your card. You agree yeah. with yeah. And we, we, do have, we do have some single practitioners within our MSO and, and they, they rely heavily on us. Uh, we I, as the MSO um, provide, you know, the coders and the chart reviews, and and, and they, they, yeah, they they really need a lot of support. So we we're gonna borrow five more minutes for Dr. Arthur Hansen. He put the point on. See, Arthur, tell us about your experience, your advice about MRA. Hi guys, thank you for having me. So you guys are obviously trailblazers in the value-based care with the ACO. Uh, Dr. Argerwald, Dr. Bansell, they're leading the charge in many states and they're doing a, a, an amazing job. MRA is ex very, very important as we see the, that it's affecting your actual income in or your actual shared savings in our ACO models uh, across, the, across the, the different venues. So it's important to learn it. Extremely, extremely hard topic that takes a while to get it down pat. And this is a great introduction. Um, the, your, your speaker is awesome in, in giving that introduction, but nobody should feel like, wow, uh, it's too hard. It just takes a lot of time. Uh, unfortunately, these are the rules uh, that the CMS has given. Uh, as Dr. Bansell referenced, it's much more important in the uh, Medicare Advantage uh, space in the health plan. 
and I do want to segue into uh, that topic really fast. Um, we we at Palm Beach ACO uh, have been like you guys uh, successful on and uh, year after year, and we uh, understood early on that our value is in our network, and we built a very solid network here in South Florida, and proud of it. Uh, the network value is exponential, but it's how for how as all of us to get that value out. And we realized that it's time for us to create and move on to becoming a full-fledged health plan. And in Palm Beach, uh, effective 1121, we are making the jump in creating a Medicare Advantage health plan. Uh, at, in in parallel with our successful ACO. We're not doing it to cannibalize or destroy our ACO, by, not at all. Uh, as you guys know, we do lose some patients to Medicare Advantage yearly. Uh, and we feel that we want to try to place them in a plan of our own. Why do our own health plan? Why take the risk? Why raise all the money? The reason for this is we feel that we've gotten to a stage with our ACO physicians that they have passed the, the first grade, the second grade, they're into the college with value-based care, and they would have a very good chance of succeeding. And now we're at a stage where we have created our own plan with the design of what our physicians want. Our physicians have created an awesome plan. The, our physicians are owners of this plan. Thus, they are creating equity for themselves. The valuations of these health plans are off the chart. It's not only a, a plan that's going to have a tremendous amount of transparency for our physicians on actually what they get paid and what they get paid for their services, whether it's capitation or uh, even in, we have some models that are uh, obviously uh, fee for service, but we also have the shared savings portion for the individual patients, but the transparency is very, very important. So we don't have a tremendous amount of money for, or spending a tremendous amount of money on advertising. We are not spending a tremendous amount of money on, uh, on administration and infrastructure and buildings that these legacy insurance plans have. We're doing it nimble by our physicians. Thus, we have the ability to spend extra money to create an awesome, awesome disruptive product for our patients here in the marketplace. Uh, we believe the, the, the product that's been created here in Palm Beach is, in my opinion, the best Medicare Advantage product out here. Um, because we are nimble and we are creating it together, our physicians and our physicians reimbursements most probably will be the highest amongst any of the other plans here. So the reason why I'm telling you this is because I want you guys to think it's time to consider graduating college and going for your PhD program and owning a health plan in your market. It's doable. We're doing it. You guys can do it as well and you guys can do it better than anybody else, any other plans out there, because you guys know what's best for your patient. We're eliminating a lot of the red tape that a lot of these health plans do. We're opening up the lights to the brightest level in terms of transparency for our physicians to see exactly what is going on. We're taking the physician's input and actually designing the product. All is good, 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 for us as physicians. And this is something a physician can own and actually refer their patients to. Imagine that, for whatever reason, I don't know if the Stark laws or et cetera had forgotten about it, but physicians are allowed to own this and refer to it. The equity that we're going to build in this plan in terms of value when it's successful it can sometimes be considered mind boggling. Um, and we believe the best model is when physicians own their health plan. And we plan to prove it and we plan to replicate it. And hopefully if you guys give us a chance in 
in, in your regions, in Georgia, New Jersey, wherever, we would like to help you guys create the same uh, structure potentially where your physicians own equity in it and hopefully create a tremendous amount of value. We believe the ACO has been very good for our physicians. It really has. We just don't know the equity play in it in terms of it if you sold it or you cashed out, where a Medicare Advantage plan has a defined tremendous amount of equity that has been proven through the test of time for the last 40, 50 years. This is the way to go for us to control our destiny. You can do it in parallel. You can do it in parallel to the ACO and do a very good job at it and do a better job at it. And I do wanna say one thing about the importance of MRA in the plan is because it maximizes the value of your patients in order for you to give the best product in terms of design for the plan for your patients. So you don't, if you have a patient that's obviously chronically ill, we want to be able to think out of the box and be able to provide a, a different level of service to keep these patients out of the hospital healthier. The, our plan here in Palm Beach, similar to the ACO concept, is to be very proactive, be proactive, keep our patients healthier, keep them out of the hospitals, keep them out of the, 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 out of the nursing homes, keep them out of the, the home health agencies, but we, we, we have a tremendous amount of creativity and leeway to do things that you guys probably have all dreamed about. I'm sure you guys are all part of a health plan and say, wow, this is so, this is not the smartest way to go for this patient. If we do this, this would be better. I would love to you know, send this patient home in Uber. Now we have the ability to do a lot of the stuff. I would love to send this patient food maybe, or health food, or get them, you know, to get them to buy organic food for whatever reason, or think more about nutrition and be able to cover it in different ways. So we have, we have uh, the CMS gives us uh, the actual funds based on the MRA, and then we can design the plan how we want to do it. So, and there, and it is, uh, I don't want to make it sound that, it, that it's about the money because it's not, but you guys have built a tremendous, tremendous amount of value for MSOs. You've built a tremendous amount of value for health plans. Maybe it's time to consider building a tremendous amount of value for yourselves. But when you guys are ready, reach out to us and we will be there for you. We can do it as soon as the next you know, uh, we're starting 1-1-21, uh, and we can look in, at it. We want doctor owners to be in, involved in this. It's attainable, it's reachable. Our formula is going to work. We are gonna trailblaze here and hopefully can help replicate it in your markets when you're ready. So keep us in mind. Thank you for the time. Okay, so I've, I've been talking without uh, with muted thing. I want to thank uh, Arthur and Raj. You, I mean, this is a great feature and we support you. You can count on that. Not only that, we're going to make sure that all our physician friend knows that it's time for a change. Time for physician to take the leadership and do the better job than what other insurance can do. So we will be ready for you. And, and, and Terry, thank you very much, Terry. We will uh, see you more in two weeks. So this program will continue. I think this was a very rewarding uh, lecture from you. Me, I learned a lot from you that how to review your own chart. And, and if you diagnosis, you know, you got to especially you start to keep looking at the finding of the physical examination and HPI, and then should support your impression. So thank you, Correct. everybody. We will, we are 10 minutes over, but next time we will be right on time. So hopefully everybody will join us in two weeks at six o'clock, same time, same place. Thank you all.